Hello, friends. It's just a gorgeous day outside. Not too cold, not too hot, and, and wonderful greens and blues to look at besides flowers. It's just gorgeous. And we had a great day outdoors with um, preaching the word on the street. Now we're coming to this video. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 18. We've been doing seven parables the ones that Matthew chose and none of the other gospel writers used. So if you if you like this content as we go along, please feel free to subscribe, to like the video itself. And um, I think there's a notification thing you can press so that you will not lose any for the future of this series and the next um, series after this is really fun. I'm working it hard on the street and it will come to the video as soon as we finish this series. Matthew 18, we're starting with verse 21 and we'll go to the end of the chapter. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. And before we read, let's pray. O Lord, most holy, we recognize that without you, we cannot understand your word. And so we ask for your presence, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and for a, a humble spirit to understand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Should it be seven times? Jesus said to him, I don't say to you until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children too, and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired me to. Should not you also have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise, will my heavenly father do also to you if you from your hearts do not forgive every one his brother their trespasses. That's the reading of Matthew 18. 21 to 35. Yes, the pollen is thick out there, so my throat is 
needing tea every once in a while. We're studying the parables that Matthew especially chose, parables recorded by Matthew and by no other gospel writer. Matthew 13 is a sermon or discourse made up of seven parables of heaven's kingdom. These seven parables appear in two groups. In the first set, there is a longer parable with explanation and two very short parables, all teaching about astonishing growth in heaven's kingdom. These are found also in the records of the other three gospel writers. And we did not explore these in this series. In the second set of parables in Matthew 13 are one longer parable with explanation and three very short parables, all unique to Matthew, that is especially chosen by Matthew. It seems to me that the theme common to these four parables in Matthew 13 is inclusion and inclusivity. In the parable of the man sowing sorted grade A seed, the believer's project is to keep inclusion and inclusivity with respect, keep it now, and let God do the judging and sorting later. In the parable of the treasure, we discovered that some things had to be sorted and dropped away during an individualized quest to purchase the field with the treasure. In the parable of the merchant and his pearl, we learned further of the shaping of choice and values in which some values cannot be included alongside the highest values. With the parable of the net, we return to the teaching that inclusion and inclusivity is our focus. What belongs to us and God will take care of the judging and sorting what needs to be sorted. Three more parables call for our attention now as those which Matthew especially chose to include in his gospel. The first one, the king with an indebted servant, shows how forgiveness is imperative in policies of inclusion. That is, forgiveness in either direction it must flow, in or out. The second parable, the man hiring workers, will teach us more about God's policies of inclusion and inclusivity. The third parable, the man with two sons and a vineyard to work, shows how some exclude themselves from the blessings of working with God. Here is the parable of the king with an indebted servant. Heaven's kingdom is like a king reviewing his servants. Early in the process, one servant comes to his attention to owes, who owes him a debt totaling 15 years of wages. Since he has no money to pay the debt, the king decrees that he, his wife and children, and all that he has must be sold to pay the debt. The servant falls down in great emotion begging the king for patience and promising to pay all. The king has compassion, removes the handcuffs, and forgives the entire debt. Then this servant number one goes out and looks up another servant who owes servant number one a day's wages. Servant number one grabs him by the throat and demands, pay me now. Servant number two falls down before his creditor, begging for patience and promising to pay all. Servant number one refuses and gets him locked up in prison until he can find friends and family to pay the debt for him. Other servants, having observed the whole set of events and feeling deeply sorry about it, tell it all to the king. Then the king calls in servant number one to berate him as a wicked servant, recall the forgiveness of all that huge debt, and ask should, not, should he not have had compassion on his fellow servant to reflect the king's compassion on himself? 
The king is angry and sends him to the tormentors until he pays the entire huge debt. This is how the Heavenly Father will treat you if you fail to forgive your brothers and sisters for even the smallest trespasses. Now, the debtor's prison with torment and without deliverers is my situation without Jesus. My debt is more than 15 years wages, but at least 70 years wages. There is no way for me to pay it off. My only solution is to apply desperately to the one who bought my forgiveness on Calvary. When I ask for it in humility, knowing my poverty and my debt, I have forgiveness at that moment because of Jesus' death, which was accepted for me from the foundation of the world. I can walk free of shame and full of joy. Then, I bring to mind someone who mocked me when I was a child, or someone who caused me to have a car accident, or even someone who shames me for my belief in Jesus' forgiveness. Maybe I investigate and find the person who stole my wallet, or maybe I research and find that one of my employees has taken a couple hundred dollars from the cash box. Or perhaps I remember the person who took over my project after I did all the research for it. Some of you might say, ah, forgiveness is brutally unfair. This is not justice. That person who wronged me goes free with no responsibility or shame on himself. I have to bear it all, foot the whole bill, pay the whole cost. For one thing, no, I do not bear the whole cost. Jesus did that. For the second thing, my forgiveness can only ever be a letting go a relaxing of my clenched fist and of my clenched teeth, a turning away from my revenge. I cannot work the correct amount and kind of vengeance. I cannot mend or heal the damage I did to the other person's hurts that caused his or her abuse of me. I learn to let go of those items in God's justice. Truly, this release is not so much a release of the other person as it is a release of myself from attitudes that have a very negative impact on my life and relationships. As long as I hold the other person in my unforgiveness, I am handcuffed to him or her. It turns out, that the person I let go free is myself. What a miracle of grace. For a third thing, I think we will study how God forgives. The parable of the king with an unforgiving servant teaches us that we must pass on forgiveness to others in order to live in the forgiveness that God provides. Matthew's record of the prayer Jesus taught his disciples says as much, forgive us as we forgive others. Some hear this as a saying that forgiveness automatically and immediately brings the two people together in in living or financial arrangements as before the hurtful incident. And some will accuse the abused of lack of forgiveness when they choose not to live again with the abuser. We will study God's forgiveness. 
Now, the study of how God forgives leads me to a story in the Old Testament, which I hope you will follow with me now. This story helped form the background for the listener's hearing of Jesus' parable. Now, we learned in the previous chapter that Adam and Eve gave, gave all their descendants over to death when they chose the serpent's lies. That choice against God and life is called sin and was addressed in the first of the Ten Commandments that God gave to Israel, that this God is the only God. We also learned that God is neither pleased with nor willing for the death of any human. <clears throat> God sent his son Jesus on an unimaginably costly mission to save humans from death. We're driven to ask, how could that be done in fairness? This transfer of life instead of death could be imagined and accomplished only in the mercy and kindness of God, wherein God arranged that the guilt or the results of sin could be transferred. Since this is such a surprising development, God prepared an entire action curriculum to teach it to humans. First, there was a lamb. Abel, the second son of Adam and Eve, gave God a lamb from his flock. And God was pleased to let that lamb bear Abel's sin. Of course, this was not fair for the lamb, an innocent creature receiving the consequences of some human sin. Later, Abraham was known to offer lambs to God. It seems to me that the whole story of the call of Abraham to sacrifice his son and then at the crucial moment to direct him to offer a ram, which is an adult male lamb, instead of his son, I think this whole story in Genesis 22 is part of the curriculum to help humans come to understand that someone could die in their place. Then when Israel had been led out from Egyptian slavery and stopped to camp around Mount Sinai, God gave Moses detailed instructions for what they called a tent of meeting or a tabernacle or sanctuary with all its offerings and feasts. This was the primary curriculum and it consisted of activity, doing to learn. The purpose of the sanctuary is clear, to make it possible that God could live among them. God will not stay where he is not wanted or where sin is wanted. He needed a curriculum by which they could learn how to choose him and accept his forgiveness. Forgiveness is what happens when the results or consequences of sin are transferred to someone who did not choose that sin. Many pages in the Bible are taken up to explain the sanctuary, its furniture, its offerings, and its feasts. I will try to summarize it here for you. A very short summary here, and a slightly longer and more detailed summary in an addendum to this chapter. That would be in the book, not on the video. The sanctuary, its furniture, its offerings, and its feasts comprised a curriculum by which humans could know God. 
They could know God's ways. No other God did this for any other nation. The structure and furniture of the sanctuary were set up to venerate God's throne in the inner room as most holy. Regarding the sacrifices of the sanctuary, the lesson seems logical from the daily sacrifice of an innocent animal that sin with its guilt and results can be transferred. I believe God wanted to show that the best place for sin was in his sanctuary transferred there through the lamb and the blood at the lamb's death. The sinner went away free, no longer burdened at all. Among the feasts of the sanctuary, a day of atonement in the fall of the year was a fast day prepared for by the Feast of Trumpets to announce its solemnness and to allow for any individual to bring an offering to the sanctuary. This Day of Atonement was followed by the Feast of Tabernacles, full of joy and release of forgiveness and restoration. This Day of Atonement was the day when all the transferred sins that had accumulated in the sanctuary were to be tended. The sanctuary was to be cleansed, restored, put right again, vindicated, freed from even the record of sin. I believe we now live in the Day of Atonement, after which Jesus will come, exhibiting the joy and the release of the Feast of Tabernacles. In that case, what might Jesus want me to understand about the Day of Atonement now? We know the sanctuary was training curriculum so we could understand God better and his plan for dismissing sin and restoring God's kingdom. We know that it was made so God could live with God's people. This curriculum then was necessarily about how God's forgiveness works. When I ask forgiveness of God and Jesus in prayer, my sin participates in that great Lamb of God offering on Calvary. I am forgiven. I go free and unburdened. There is nothing more for me to do with that sin. As far as I'm concerned, it is buried in the depths of the sea. Jesus completed my forgiveness on Calvary. Let me ask, what if God and Jesus still have work to do, like helping me walk in that forgiveness and learn to freely forgive others? What if they want all the creatures in heaven and elsewhere to do all the research necessary into this process of transferring sin so they will be convinced forever that God is good and just and merciful all at the same time? What if God will work out a finish that is fair and just to everyone? And that means that Satan, the devil, the serpent, has much to bear away into the wilderness and his final death. I think that is what the Day of Atonement is about. I think we are living in it now. I think when God has finished with fairness all around, Jesus will come with huge rejoicing as during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now I think we are ready to discover the lessons about forgiveness from the Old Testament stories around the sanctuary. My first step in forgiving another is release. I let the vengeance in my clenched teeth and fists fall to the depths of the sea. Yes, 
that person goes free, as free as I am when I accept God's forgiveness. My second step in coming to justice is exploring, investigating, to see whether it would be good for both of us to come back into closer relationship. If it was abuse, and I have reason to believe the abuse would continue, then I will probably exclude that person from my most intimate circles. This is no more than God does right now. Believers now are forgiven and free, and we can see that we are not yet allowed into the celestial circles. God is still working on us. I believe God is still working on others, too. And perhaps my forgiveness and release of them will allow them to open their hearts more to God. Then one day, Jesus may bring the two of us together in those celestial realms where we have eternity to create all the closeness possible. To conclude, I want to take us all the way back to inclusion and inclusivity, the thing God wants us to work on here, by which to keep our hands out of any judging or sorting business while waiting for God to do the big sort at the end. We already learned that this inclusion and inclusivity will discard or pass by some things when we invest all our energies and sell everything for the treasure and the pearl. In this parable of the net, now in the parable of the net, we learned that this inclusion may release people to be in their own lives and not connected with us, either by revenge or anxiety about closeness. God's inclusion is a nuanced inclusion. Not to be presumed upon or boxed into a humanly devised shape. God's plan for inclusion and inclusivity developing in me will release all into the justice and joy of God's kingdom. I want to pray for us. Join me if you wish. Oh, loving Father, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that you bought this forgiveness on Calvary and that it has been available to humans from the very first thought of humans. We thank you who could ever have come up with that plan of transferring sin? But that's what you did. We praise you, not only for your dominion over all and your ability to rule all, but we praise you for the, the plan that you worked out for us to understand you better and for us to be forgiven. So we ask your forgiveness for the times when we forget that you are the one who can forgive us and we carry on our vengeance and revenge. We let it fester in our own minds and hearts and in our bodies. We ask your forgiveness for the times that our own lack of forgiveness has hurt others when we've gone about hurting others. And we thank you for that forgiveness and for the healing that you only can bring. And in the joy and freedom of that forgiveness, we look to you for every need. Some of us have great needs in dealing with our behavior or with our anger and revenge. 
Some of us have great needs or we see great needs in the world of vengeance spiraling into wars and generational um, revenge. Lord, we ask for your presence here on earth among all who suffer. Yes, all who suffer that we might grow in our forgiveness, thereby set ourselves free from this vengeance that we so often feel must be given by us. Oh Lord, teach us, teach us after your own ways. And so thank you for the sanctuary you gave us. Please teach us to come to you, bringing our own sacrifice our own hubris that we lay on the altar for you and we ask your forgiveness. Lord, please bless those of our friends who are um, suffering great grief right now from a loss. Uh, those who are in some kind of estrangement, either at home or at work or at school those who are running out of resources um, in this time of inflation and economic insecurity. Lord, you know how to bring us the resources we need. You know how to stand among us in our suffering and bring us peace in this. We think of the wars, we think of the earthquakes. We think of the flooding and the fires and the whole suffering of the whole world could overwhelm us. And so we just look to you. Teach us what we can do and teach us to trust you. I thank you for what you've already done for each of us and for what you're doing right now. I thank you for hearing us. And I believe that through all eternity, we will be praising you for what you are doing right now in each of our lives. Through all eternity, we will be giving you the dominion, the power, and the glory forever. We've asked it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm Wilma Zollebach, and I'm with Grace Chapel Fellowship, which is a church to bless other churches, where listening is our unity. And I have about six themes that just come up all the time. One of them, God is good. Two, humans have been taken away from good. Three, Jesus came to bring us back. And four, I can't do that, but God can. And I decide to let God. Two more. One, the Bible is worth reading. And two, the Sabbath is a gift worth remembering. So, hope to see you next time. Go ahead and like this video and subscribe. And until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you.